I I'm, uh, want to thank... Yeah, he might be watching. That's terrible. <laughs> um, I do want to thank the, the team here for filling in for him. Don't they do an amazing job even without him? And <laughs> if we have not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I'm delighted to be the teaching pastor here at Highland Country Fellowship, and I'm glad that you've joined us today. Um, I hope that you witness three things every time you come to our church. I hope you witness three transformations that occur. And the first is that we got a gathering of about 250 people, and it's transformed into family because of the fellowship, because of the spirit of the living God that flows out of so many of you. And I feel it. And on days like today where I'm really distracted by current events, you bring me up, and I thank you for that. So we have just ordinary gatherings that are transformed into fellowship, and I hope you can sense that. And because of these, these are not just musicians, they are ministers of the gospel, and they transform that fellowship into worship right before our eyes every Sunday, do they not? And, and the third transformation is in your own mind. By reading the Word of God verse by verse, which is what we do here every week, you and your mind is actually transformed. You are a different person for walking out of here having heard the Word of God, and it is my privilege and pleasure to bring it to you this morning. And we are in the Gospel of Luke. We are in the 20th chapter and the 20th verse. That's easy to remember, right? Luke 20:20. 20, 20. So if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, or uh, I think we have it up on the screen, let me read this to you. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and he said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose portrait and inscription are on it? Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And to God, what is God's? They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord. And the mouth of the Lord has spoken it to you, his beloved people. Uh, This is a very, very popular story. It occurs in Matthew. It occurs in Mark. And, of course, it occurs here in Luke. And the title for today's sermon is give to Caesar what is Caesar's. <laughs> and some of you do that every time you go there. <laughs> I thought, it's, you know, I struggle with this because, you know, I thought, well, that's kind of a little crass, having a picture of Caesar's palace, but I, it does kind of communicate what the Jews thought of paying taxes to Caesar. They didn't feel good about it at all. So I think we'll go with that, although there were some alternate choices for a title for this sermon today. One of them I thought was a taxing dilemma, you know, but, <laughs> but we'll, we'll go with this today. And, and let's, let's talk about, this occurred in the temple. It occurred during what we're calling Passion Week, and I want to set the stage for you a little bit just to remind you where we are and what's going on with Jesus here. He's in Jerusalem at the temple, and he came riding in on Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday. And this is the last week of his earthly ministry. Jesus is is on a collision course here with a Friday afternoon death on a cross for you and me. Um, He has awakened enemies in the three years he's been ministering, not just this week. It's been pretty intense this week, but all the time he's been ministering and teaching. People have been opposed to his philosophy And they've been scared by his influence. And the last verse just before this, we ended in verse 19, said the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. So this has been building for some time. The religious leaders of of Judaism, but also the political leaders uh, of of this Roman-occupied territory called Israel, They've determined they want him gone. They want him arrested. And that is going to happen, but not today. This, we think, is, you know, if I'm guessing, I'm guessing this event took place on Wednesday of that week, and 
Jesus will allow them to arrest him between Thursday night and Friday morning, and he will, be, uh, he will have some sham trials, and he will head to a Roman cross, and he's timing his life and ministry to end at around 3 o'clock on Friday at the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. So he's going to allow this to happen to him, but not today. For today, he's been teaching in the temple, and he's had a busy week. He rode in on a donkey to the praise of a lot of people. And that symbolized a king offering peace, but it also was a symbol of the fact that he was the Messiah. And, and they didn't like that. They told him to stop, and he says, I'm not stopping this. And then he went in, and the next day he cleansed the temple. He got rid of the animal vendors and the money changers. And everyone knew that those things were wrong. And it was such an indictment of the temple leadership because they were either allowing it, and they shouldn't have been, or they were in on it. And that's, honestly, we, th we think they were kind of in on it, making some money from that. So Jesus, everyone knows this is wrong. Jesus drives it out. But that makes them mad. So they ask him, say, um, where did you get the authority to come in here and cleanse the temple? And he says to him, well, I got my authority the same place John the Baptist got his authority. Do you know where that is? And they said, no, we don't. He says, oh, that's too bad. And then he walked away. That's kind of the way that went down. You can read it for yourself. The last two Sundays, we've been talking about a scathing parable, verses 9 through 19, that he's been telling about these religious leaders, about how God has created a vineyard that is the nation of Israel, and he planted it well, and that they were the caretakers, the tenants of it, but they were not good tenants. As a matter of fact, they, they didn't produce fruit, and they didn't give any of the share of any of it back to God. And, and that's... That's what he had spoken about that was, made them so mad. They said they knew that parable was about them. And, and he even, even began to prophesy that they would kill him and that God would tear the vineyard away from them and he would build something new with Jesus as the cornerstone of a new building, the stone the builders rejected. Do you remember that? Last week, if you were here, we sang, I go to the rock, and I still have it in my head because of the way Angela sang it so beautifully, right? But today... We begin with intrigue and mystery and conspiracy. It really, it, it, it's, it's pretty intense. Verse 20 tells us, keeping a close watch, they sent spies. Now, I'm not just making this up. They sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. Okay? So they're sending people that are going to pretend they're really interested in what Jesus has to say. Oh, will you tell us? Because we're really interested in being righteous, you know? And this is, this is disingenuous. Jesus calls them duplicitous later. Now, this account occurs in Matthew and Mark and Luke, as we've told you. And if you were to lay these side by side, there's not very few, many words that are different between them. But Mark does tell us something that's really interesting here. It's an important part of the plot. In Mark chapter 12, verse 13, he says this, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians... To Jesus to catch him in his words. Herodians. These would be people that, that were disciples of the Herods, the Herod family. Herod the Great was the king of Israel, and he wasn't really the king. Rome ruled Israel, and they installed a puppet dictator in Herod the Great. And the Jews hated him. First of all, he, was a, a, he wasn't really a, a purebred Jewish person to them, but more than that, he was selling out to the Romans, and he was serving as a king. And so Herod the Great died at around the time of Jesus' birth, but he had sons that were taking over, and the Herodians were people that were kind of like the British royalty that were loyal to Herod being king, and they thought maybe it will go easier for us if we can prove that we, with the Herods as kings, can manage Rome better, or manage Israel better, and keep Rome away. But the, the Jewish people in Israel hated these people. And so, I don't know, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they have nothing to do with one another, except they both are afraid of Jesus. So you might have heard the expression that politics makes strange bedfellows. Well, this is a case where two people that normally would not ever get along are, are coming together to try and catch Jesus. And so let's make sure we understand the Pharisees, and you might hear the Pharisees, scribes, teachers of the laws, chief priests, these are people that are upset with Jesus because of his philosophy. 
He's been teaching that there are legalistic ways of you do this and you do this and you got to do this to be righteous. He's been teaching that that's wrong and he's been bringing people directly to God. And that's, that's, that's why we follow him today. But that undermined their power. See, if you get to tell people what they have to do in order to be right with God, you have a lot of power over them and they knew it. The Herodians were scared of Jesus because if he creates a massive public uprising, it will undermine the theory that Israel could be managed by the ruling Herod family. That's why they did away with John the Baptist. They didn't like people that could cause insurrections because they had much public following. So these two groups have come together, and it says they've been trying to trap Jesus in something he would say. Well, what? How's that going to work? Well, first we've got to put up with verse 21. Uh, Be careful. If you've just recently eaten, this might make you sick. So the spies questioned him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Gag me. This is like watching Eddie Haskell on an episode (laughs) of Leave it to Beaver, and I know none of you are actually old enough to have watched it when it first came out. Who are we kidding? So, I mean, some of you starred in it. Um, but th- this, is, this is just so, dis- it's just dripping with, oh my gosh. And part of it is that we know they're not genuine. So they're just buttering up. But they, they're doing, what's interesting is that <laughs> they're accidentally telling the complete truth about Jesus. That's what's kind of funny about this to me. I mean, they're doing this with the most ignoble motives. And yet, Jesus does uh, teach what is right. Jesus does uh, not show partiality people, and he does indeed teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So th- these, these accidental Eddie Haskells tell, are telling the truth about Jesus. And, and, but that was not their purpose. Uh, God may have used them to do that, but their purpose was to try, they think they're dealing with a human being in Jesus. And so they're thinking, we'll gain his trust, we'll get him kind of in close and we'll say, tell us, tell us the answer to this question. And that he'll actually maybe open up something that we can use against him. Well, what is it they're going to ask him? Verse 22. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Boom. There's the trap set. And and what we're going to take a minute to understand is why is that such a big trap? Well, they've asked him an either or question. right? And by the way, that should be a clue. You know, when someone says, do you still beat your wife? You know, you, you, you seem to have been given a choice there of what we call a false dichotomy, meaning I'm forcing you into A or B, right? It's an either or question. Should we or not? What is it, Jesus? Should we pay taxes or not? And, and part of this is the, this word that they use to pay taxes to Caesar is different than the kinds of normal taxes that they would pay. Nobody likes taxes. I don't. The Jews at that time didn't. They had tax collectors that if you, had, if you raised 40 chickens on your way into selling them, the tax collector might take 10 of them, right? And they hated that. I would hate it too, but they at least viewed that as commerce. What this was, was it was different. This was a tax that was paid specifically to Caesar and for no other reason than he was the divine Tiberius. So they viewed it as though they were making like a sacrifice to a false god. Does that make sense? So this specific tax is what they were railing against. They were, when it comes to the other taxes, they probably hated them just like you and I do. But this is the one that was blasphemous. And the idea among the popular religious opinion was, we can pay these other taxes, but this is one we shouldn't. This is a blasphemous tax that honors the emperor. So now you understand their question. Jesus, should we pay it or not? If he says yes, pay it, then he's losing some of his righteousness points in their mind because he's going to be advocating that they go along with this idea that Caesar is is divine. And he's going to lose a lot of the popular opinion of people that are following him. Does that make sense? Because these people that are following him think he's going to overthrow Rome right? They think he's just as anti-Rome as they ever were. As a matter of fact, they're hoping that he will just march in and overthrow it. If he says, no, don't pay, and by the way, that would be what a populist person today would say is whatever the people will go along with, right? If he says, no, don't pay these, then they've got the Herodians there 
loyal to Rome, witnessing him saying, don't pay taxes to Caesar. And they go report him, and they get Rome to arrest him and possibly execute him as an insurrectionist. See, Rome didn't put up with a lot of that stuff. So I hope you catch the dilemma here. They've asked him, do we pay it or not? Huh. So what, what do you think is going to happen? Well, um, by the way, you've got to assume they're high-fiving each other right now. I, I mean, I think they've laid a pretty clever trap. And whatever you think of these guys, you think, okay, that's, that's not bad. And they've tried to catch Jesus before, and they can't. But, but here we go. He saw through, verse 23, he saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius. By the way, this is the original show me the money statement right here. <laughs> That's what that is. That's exactly what that is. I'm not taking any grief from you guys about that. Show me a denarius. He says, whose portrait and inscription are on it? And so... Luke says that he saw through their duplicity. (laughs) Matthew's version is funnier. I like it. I'm going to share it with you. In Matthew 22, beginning in verse 18, But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? It's the same content right? There's no idea that we're not watching the same event here described by Luke or described by Matthew, but it's kind of funny. I like that. You hypocrites. So he's he's caught them in their trap. And this, this really could have been enough. Jesus could have said, you know what? You're not asking an honest question. I know who you are. You're Herodians. You're Pharisees. You've been sent here as spies to try and trap me, and I'm not falling into your trap. And he walked away, and that would have been still pretty amazing, wouldn't it? But he doesn't do that. He, he exposes them, and then he goes right at their question because he doesn't fear it at all. Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And the coin used for paying the tax was a denarius. I've got a, a picture of a gold denarius here. They were, they were uh, minted in gold and silver, um, and the silver would have been thicker and a little bit uh, bigger to contain an, an equal amount of value. But this, this represented about a day's working wage. Uh, on the front of it, um, you can see a picture of the Emperor Tiberius. What a nose that guy has on him, right? I mean, if, it, it, I'd be careful if I had been the one who chiseled that picture. You, you could be in trouble for that. That's not, that's not a good deal. Um, but this is Tiberius. The inscription says, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of divine Augustus. All right? On the back is uh, uh, the the inscription says high priest and it's thought to be an image of his mother portraying the goddess of peace okay so you you understand these coins themselves imply there's some divinity here and, and nobody really liked them all right and we don't know but jesus has asked show me one of these and someone produced one now this is kind of funny in and of itself to me i might be reading this in because i'm kind of a naughty little boy but but I think the fact that Jesus asked someone in the crowd to produce it tells us something about it. Like if I was in a, if I was in a convention of Baptist preachers and someone said, did you see the new labels that they printed on the alcohol bottles, the warning labels? I said, no. Can you show me one? And five of them pulled one out and showed me. <laughs> uh, okay, you're getting the idea. That's an old joke and it's not very good, but you get the, you get the point, don't you? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. Oh, we hate that coin. Oh, here's one. That's the way I see it, okay? I mean, you can't be too terribly opposed to it if you've got it in your pocket, right? Or your purse or whatever they carried around in their shoe or who knows. So someone, at least one person, produces a denarius. Whose portrait and inscription are on it, he asked. Caesar's, they replied. And then this is it right here. said, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, Right? I mean, they tried to force him to answer an either-or question, and he answers with a both-and answer. And it's just, it's kind of like a mic drop moment, if you're young enough to know what that is. And I'm not. I have sons that do that to me and tell me about it, right? So they're they're like, should we pay or not? And he says, yes, both, right? If Caesar wants his money back, pay it to him. It's got his picture on it. But make no mistake, the realm and influence of Caesar as compared to the realm and influence of God. Do you hear it? Wow, that's awesome. He's he's not only taken their question head on, 
He's given us a pretty good Christian civics lesson here, hasn't he? Because we can apply that today. I'll tell you something as we drill into this, and, and I, I thought a lot about this. I've, honestly, it's been very distracting to think about this in the wake of what's happened in the last 24 hours. But one of the things Jesus says, and by extension Paul will say it as well in the writings of the New Testament, is that there's, we, we think that a bad government is oppressive, and I'm sure it is, it, but it's all relative. Because the, the worse than bad government is no government. Wheels off anarchy is something that we are so far from where we are that when we see glimpses of it, it's a horror movie. Literally, there have been horror movies. One like The Purge was made recently about the idea of just total wheels off anarchy and what that would be like. And I'm so glad that we don't really experience that. We don't. If we, if with, with us, we see it and we see it as a nightmare. But see, God remembers it. God remembers it in the time before Noah. God remembers it in Sodom and Gomorrah. God remembers it as the Russians invaded Berlin. God remembers it as the Japanese occupied Nanking, China. We got a glimpse of it in El Paso. We got a glimpse of it in Dayton for just seconds. And it's ugly. Once in a while, the curtain is pulled back and we realize the evil that is being restrained by the presence of God in this world. And it's horrifying. And God is telling us, your bad government that you don't like is still better than no government. Amen? Paul teaches us this directly, and I think it's worth reminding ourselves of, brothers and sisters. In Romans chapter 13, Paul says this, Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, if you don't like the word established there, use the word allowed, and you'll understand the same thing. There's no authority that is over us that has not been allowed by God because of God's sovereign control of the universe. He has allowed these governments. That doesn't mean he agrees with all of it. Make no mistake. God isn't endorsing everything that's going on with the government, but he's allowed the government to have control over us. We saw that as a pattern in the Old Testament. We live it out now. Okay? And here's why. Paul takes it up with verse 2. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who will do so bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. And even last night and yesterday, we saw this. This, this government of ours couldn't necessarily restrain the evil that are in people's hearts. But after it started, it was agents of our government that stopped it. It was agents of our government that ran in to help people in need. And it was agents of our government, first responders, we call them. Amen? We, we pray for these people and we recognize that they serve us by restraining evil. And when they... Amen. Thank you. And when they catch the people that are doing it, they do not bear the sword for nothing. On our behalf, they, they take them out or they arrest them and they're tried. And this is part of what, what Paul is saying. And this is, by the way, this is written in first century Rome. And what, what Paul is telling you is, look, the, the, the idea of not having rampant murder and thievery and rape in your community means that there's going to be a government and it serves you more then you think it detracts from your freedom because of the fact that it restrains evil. I hope that makes sense. And that's, that's really the point here. By the way, the Romans, who were brutal in so many ways, we can't condemn their, especially by today's standards, we can't condemn their, their forms of government and their forms of punishment. And yet, for two centuries, there was something called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, which the Romans had so enforced 
that there were no major wars between nations for two centuries, and it was safe for commerce to travel and safe for the spread of the gospel. So we have to understand that there are some things about this that as much as we want to protest our government, we live in a fantastic place, don't we? Because we have the right to protest our government. We can complain about how much tax we pay. We actually can. And we can change it. We can, we can influence, we can vote for people that, that are going to change those things and different policies, however you... But, but it really is when we think about it. It's so much better to have a government that protects us than to not. And this is what Paul's reminding us. And the last part of this is kind of interesting. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes for the authorities or God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And those first responders deserve whatever taxes I paid to help them respond. Amen? So we submit. And the Bible teaches us that most of the time we should simply submit to the government because the government is providing a service to us that is overall better than that that is against us. This is what Paul is teaching. It's nice to live in a country where we can freely oppose that, but even if you couldn't, Listen to what Paul says in, in, in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent upon anyone. So part of what he's saying is, make sure nobody has to pick up the tab for you as you work among these people, but let them notice you for your spiritual life not for your protests. Be careful that your Facebook page doesn't look like you're an anti, 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 but let them know you for the quiet life that you lead in Jesus. Amen? It doesn't mean there are things you can't oppose. We have a great way to oppose them here at the ballot box. Now, there is an obvious question here, which is, well, wait a minute, what about those things that we need to oppose, right? Aren't there cases, even in the Bible, where people just could not obey their government? There are. There absolutely are. There are times when there is a conflict between obeying God and obeying government. There's actually there, there are lots of examples. I want to bring two, to, two of them to your mind. Uh, the clearest is in Acts chapter 4. This is after Jesus has been resurrected, after the Holy Spirit has been poured out on his disciples. And Peter and John go into the temple. They heal a crippled man, and they, they teach people about salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. The Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, gets mad at him and call, call them in, beginning in verse 18. Then they called them in and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. We could stop right there. Amen? I mean, it, I, mean it, I, I don't have any choice. I obey God rather than you. Don't take it wrong. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So the obedient to God and government, if it comes into conflict, you know, Charles Stanley, I love Charles Stanley, I hope you do too. If you're listening, say amen. Amen. Okay, if you love Charles Stanley, you know that was his phrase, not mine. He has another one of his phrases that's amazing, and he says this, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Right? So if the conflict exists between obeying God and obeying government, obey God and leave all the consequences to him, even if it puts you in danger. See, the people who chose to obey God over government still submitted to that government, even to the point of possibly dying. And and that's where we're sometimes not willing to do that. In Daniel chapter 3, we hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This was a veggie tale, and it was a good one. (laughs) Right? Just in case you need a little remedial thing. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had made a large golden idol and had passed a law that everyone would worship it, otherwise they'd be thrown into the furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't. And and it begins here in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. (laughs) I'm not even going to offer a defense. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. 
and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he doesn't, even if we die, you hear it? We want you to know, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. So uh, as, as much as we sometimes hate to think of it, because we live in the most revolutionary, rebellious country ever. We were formed out of rebel. We, we really were. We're a bunch of rebels in America. We rebel against pizza prices, for crying out loud. And, and I, I love this country. There's a lot that's great about it, but in it breeds this idea that we rebel against our government and we kind of need to just because it's fun. And the truth of the matter is we obey our government and if we, if we can't, it's because we have to obey God first. And even if that means that we then subject ourselves to the government. Now, there are a few cases where God told someone like he told Gideon to rebel against the Midianites. That's different because he's still obeying God, right? So here it is, Christian Civics 101. You ready? Very simple. Obey God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Obey the government that God has put in place over you. If ever those conflict, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. It, it, it's as simple as that. And I know there are individual cases that are tough, right? Maybe you're thinking about one now. I might get some letters and emails from some of you. What about this? What about that? There are. And this is why we have to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Absent the Holy Spirit and the revealed truth of God's word, we don't stand a chance of trying to figure these things out on our own. But Jesus made one of these things really clear. And that's the idea of paying taxes. He just simply said, it's Caesar's money. It's got his picture on it. If he wants it back, pay him back. And that's it. Well, do you know how that satisfied the spies that were after, out to get him? Well, um, verse 26. They were unable to trap him in what he had said uh, there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. And that's an improvement. Before, Jesus has just made him so mad that he's wanted to, they've wanted to kill him. Now, they're astonished by him, which is the appropriate response in the presence of God. And at least for now, they're silent. I say for now because it won't last long. On Friday, when they're trying to convict him to Rome, they're going to lie about this exchange. Perhaps one of the reasons the Holy Spirit has preserved this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is so that we know when they lie about this that they are lying about it. Take a look at, at Luke chapter 23, which we'll get to sometime. <laughs> then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar. That's a lie. That's a lie. Matthew, Mark, and Luke said so that's not what he said at all. Uh, and he claims to be Christ a king. Well, he does indeed claim that, but they're lying about this. That is another story, and we'll have to wait and get to it soon. <laughs> is my, my nose growing when I say that? <laughs> but as we close, I do want to remind you of what Jesus says. I want to look at it in a different way. I do. Because uh, Jesus asked the crowd, whose image is on this coin? And there's an implied question that he didn't ask, but it's right there if you look at it. Whose image is on this coin? And whose image is on you? Right? Are we not all made in the image of God? Right? There's an image that's on the coin, right? And, and however much we're fallen or run away from God because of our sin, we bear the imprint of him. Right? <laughs> if the coin should be paid back, to the one whose image it bears, how much more should you be paid back to the one whose image you bear? And that's his point. It's an easy way to divide up your possessions, isn't it? Take a look at whose image is on them. If anyone else's image is on it, give it up. God's image is on you. Hmm? You remember the tenants in the vineyard didn't give back to God what was rightfully due. You, my brothers and sisters, are renting God's land your body, your mind, your soul are creations of God. They cannot be made in a test tube. They cannot be fixed if they are broken by human beings. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And this is what happens. This life is fragile. And God created it, and he is allowing you to drive it for a while like a really valuable car. Give to Caesar that which is his. 
And give to God that which is his, yourself. Amen? A <laughs> hundred years from now, everything that bears someone else's name or image will be gone. Or at worst, it'll belong to somebody else. You know how that works, right? So don't hold on to your possessions too carefully. Give yourself to God as an investment in eternity. Give yourself to God because it will bring peace here and now. And give yourself to God because there is joy in it that I promise you you'd rather have than anything else. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how grateful we are to bear your image. And you stamped that image so powerfully on us that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son, Jesus, to die to redeem us and make a bridge between yourself and ourselves in our fallen condition. We're thankful for that. We ask, Father, that you strengthen us through your Holy Spirit so that we may live as those who bear your name. Lord, help us to rightly separate those matters where we obey you and those matters where we submit to the authority you've placed over us, regardless of whatever consequences that we know you'll take care of. But Lord, we, we ask that, we, that you draw us to you and fill us with you, and fill us with a joy so that we would rather have you than any possession. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.